All right, well, welcome back, everybody. Um, uh, I hope you enjoyed the lectures last week. Um, and, uh, and this week's lectures will be uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Kevin Tucker of the University of Illinois uh, at uh, Chicago. Um, I first met him uh, when he was a graduate student at University of Michigan, and I was a postdoc there. And it was either during that time or shortly after that time that he solved a um, a long uh, uh, wondered problem of whether the type th there's this there was this notion of F signature, but nobody could even prove that it really existed. And, and he was able to, to to show that it did. And then he's done lots of great um, uh, proved a lot of other nice things uh, since then. But uh, that that was uh, so that's that's Kevin. So take it away. Okay. Thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, just checking. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Great. Um, uh, so first off, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation here to, to speak in this. It's really a pleasure to tell you a story about one of my favorite objects in mathematics, honestly. Um, uh, so yeah, um, uh, the three lectures uh, are sort of broken up and have very different flavors. Um, and uh, I've tried as much as I can to balance things and do things both for a somewhat more um, beginner audience as well as an advanced audience at the same time. All right. So um, uh, just a sort of blanket disclaimer. If you can't read something I write or you don't understand something I say, please do um, speak up in the chat um, or say something and I'll, I'll see what I can do to try and fix things. All right. So. Um, uh, with that, let me get started at least a little bit. All right, so um, uh, just a blanket assumption that I'm going to use for pretty much all of the lectures. All right, so throughout, uh, let I'm going to let R um, uh, denote a, a community Dimnotherian uh, ring with a unit um, and uh, sort of uh, for simplicity, although in many of the cases you can can generalize the results beyond that, I'm going to assume throughout here that uh, let's see if I can get this to work. That R is in fact the domain. All right, so sort of blanket assumption throughout R is the domain, and of course, uh, um, like in uh, in the previous week's uh, lectures, um, uh, basically all of the rings until maybe uh, some side remarks at the very end, all the rings will be uh, of characteristic P where P is a fixed prime throughout. Okay, so with that, um, uh, let me say that uh, the power of Frobenius, right? So the power of positive characteristic here is, is that you can use Frobenius to prove theorems, right? So again, so uh, F throughout will denote the, the Frobenius endomorphism, um, in particular, the absolute Frobenius endomorphism, right? So our pth power map. And, and uh, where does the power of Frobenius really come from? It comes from uh, the ability to use that it's an endomorphism and to iterate it as much as you like, right? So um, throughout, um, I'm generally going to use the letter E to denote an iterate of Frobenius, uh, so that, and then F to the E is the P to the Eth power map. All right, so, um, and uh, just, uh, although I've just been watching uh, some pretty advanced exercises being solved. Uh, let me uh, just recall for you the sort of main takeaway definition, uh, if you like, from last week in our setting, which is a little simpler than the general case, right? So if I take an ideal I inside of R, um, I can talk about its Frobenius or uh, PDE bracket power, right? And that's just the expansion of I under the ETH uh, iterative Frobenius. Um, i.e. it's the ideal generated by the p to the eth powers of um, all of the elements of the original ideal. All right, so, and with that, um, uh, the, the tight closure of I, right, is, of course, the set of all elements X and R, right? So, okay, so um, R is a domain, so there is only one minimal prime and it's zero. Right, so saying you know, you're in the tight closure means that there exists some non-zero element C, right? 
um, with the property that um, C times X to the P to the E is in this P to the E bracket power. All right, um, and while there's some ambiguity in exactly what you put here, all right, certainly it suffices uh, to put down uh, for all, say, E bigger than or equal to zero, all right? So um, and this is an equivalent definition. Okay, so um, uh, I, I wanna sort of start off in a somewhat historically accurate manner here. So um, uh, let me uh, give you the first sort of big definition here what is uh, the test ideal? And this, this came up at least implicitly uh, in Neil's talks as well. So, and uh, one of the themes of these lectures is that uh, there are many, many, many different flavors of test ideal, right? And we're gonna see a bunch of them. Uh, so, but uh, just again, maybe for the experts, uh, this test ideal is the finitistic tight closure test ideal. All right, so what is this? Well, um, in the definition of tight closure, all right, so the point here is this element little c uh, can depend on the x that you chose, right? And so at the most naive level, um, the, the test ideal of R is um, the set of all elements that are going to work in all tight closure uh, tests, uh, all tight closure relations for all ideals and all elements and all tight closures. Right, so um, all right. So here, just as a starting definition, if you will. All right, so let's just uh, define this test ideal to be the set of all elements C inside of R. Right, so that um, uh, C x to the p to the e is in I bracket p to the e. Right. Okay. For all uh, ideals I inside of R. All elements x in I star, right? And uh, for all uh, e bigger than or equal to zero, right? So the set of all C's that work in all tight closure relations everywhere. Okay. Um, and as Neil mentioned, uh, completely not obvious, right? Here that such, uh, well, okay. So um, uh, if you're being very careful here, you'll notice that there's always a C that works. I can put in C equals zero, right? So this ideal really consists of all test elements together with zero, right? Um, but uh, not obvious that uh, this uh, finitistic test ideal contains any non-zero elements at all, right? That there exists such a guy. And in some sense, um, uh, the most important argument I wanna sketch for you uh, today and the main point of today's lecture is we're gonna go through and give a, um, a version of the proof that test elements exist. Okay, so uh, that's sort of where we're headed. Okay, so um, uh, let me immediately take this though and uh, give you another uh, way to write down and interpret this test ideal. All right, so um, the following is, uh, is really an exercise. Right, so one can check um, that this finitistic test ideal is the same thing as, well, look at an intersection over all of the ideals I inside of R and look at the elements that, that multiply the tight closures back into the original ideals I. All right, so intersection over all uh, ideals I inside the ring, right? Um, and I'm, I'm requiring that you, um, uh, C times I star is inside of I for all of the possible ideals you can choose. All right, now um, uh, one containment here uh, sort of is, is obvious from my definition. I have included uh, E equals zero, right? In this definition here, um, and uh, that makes it uh, sort of pretty clear. Just using equals zero, we see uh, um, that this guy is contained inside of this one, All right? Um, and sort of uh, to do the easy exercise, you just have to understand a little bit about how tight closure plays around with bracket powers. This is not a deep exercise, right? But um, uh, maybe I should say um, uh, in the notes, uh, which are up online, uh, I've put in way more exercises, all right, than uh, I would expect you to, to, to finish and turn in. And the range of levels of the exercises uh, is pretty big, 
right? So I've designated seven of them, I think, um, as sort of star exercises. And a star exercise in the notes is one of the official ones to turn in for the, for the problem session. Um, uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, some of them are designated as challenging, um, and we'll run across them throughout, right? So, but um, uh, uh, take care. Uh, you might want to go through and do uh, the easier ones first as you go through, um, and then come back, perhaps even after this lecture series, um, to try and, and complete the picture, OK? All right, so um, great. So here is our first uh, main object of study, this finitistic test ideal, right? So the set of all uh, elements C that work in all tight closure um, relations uh, inside of your ring, OK? All right, so well, what's the advantage of introducing sort of this second perspective? Well, um, one of the reasons I like it is uh, this makes it pretty clear just from face value, all right, that, um, uh, that uh, you can, in some sense, see this test ideal as trying to get it a way to use tight closure to um, measure the singularities of your ring. All right, so um, as, uh, as was shown last week, um, uh, in a regular ring, all ideals are tightly closed, all right? So in particular, what that means is that all of these colon ideals are the trivial ideal, right? Um, and so if your ring uh, um, has the property that all ideals are tightly closed, then uh, from this description, it's very clear, right, that the finitistic test ideal is the whole ring. Okay, so let me put that sort of as a as a separate thing here. All right, so um, uh, this finitistic test ideal is equal to the ring if and only if R is so called weakly F regular. All right, so I E. all ideals are tightly closed, OK? Um, uh, and so, uh, um, great. Um, so here's the first object of study. Um, uh, I've tried to say that this should be used in some way to think about, um, uh, you know, give some ideal, which is measuring uh, the singularity of R in some way. But uh, before really doing anything else, I want to say that you sort of immediately see a bunch of massive difficulties with using this definition. Okay. So let's talk about a couple of them. So the first, right, um, and uh, in some sense, this is to do with this word weekly right here. So this word weekly uh, um, comes up uh, from sort of one of the biggest problems that still remains open um, for. Um, uh, in the theory of tight closure, let me move this up a little bit, All right? So um, open question, does weak F regularity localize? I.e. if I have a ring which is weakly F regular, like a, like a regular ring, and I, and I localize, um, does it stay weakly F regular? And, and we still don't know. Right, so um, how do I see that from this sort of test ideal description? Well, um, when you look at this intersection, I want you to be worried about two things. All right, um, the first is that this here is an infinite intersection, and uh, again, remember that infinite intersections do not commute with localization in general. You need them to be finite. All right, so the first problem you run into in trying to to play around with localization is that you can't move your uh, multiplicative set past this intersection. And then even if you do, all right, now you end up with the problem here that uh, inside of this colon ideal, uh, as was referenced by, uh, by Neil, all right, um, uh, tight closure does not commute with, uh, the, with localization either, right? So, so we have major problems showing up here and trying to deal with that, okay? All right, um, uh, so, uh, I want to make this question a little bit more precise just to really hammer this home. And again, there will be a, a later lecture series about this, right? So, but um, um, one could ask for something even stronger um, than asking that weak F regularity passes to localizations. One could ask that, again, when I'm talking about commuting localization beyond uh, these two operations, 
I'd love to see that the finite statistic test ideal also is compatible with localization. All right, so I, you, what do I mean by that, right? You could ask, does, um, all right, so if W is a multiplicative set inside of R, you would like to see that if I localize the test ideal, oops, does that uh, give me the test ideal of the localization for an arbitrary multiplicative, multiplicative set? Okay, well, um, we don't know that, but I'd be much happier um, in fact, or I'd be just as happy, uh, pretty much, with uh, some weaker versions of the same thing, right? So here, uh, I could also ask that just if you take a single element, and invert it, does that commute with the formation of this test ideal? Right? Um, and, uh, okay, so, um, uh, and similarly, I could also ask for what happens if I localize just at a prime, right? So I could ask if I uh, take uh, a prime P inside of spec R and I localize the test ideal, I could ask, do I get the test ideal of the localization at that prime? All right, so all of these remain open. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I phrase, say it this way is I'm gonna reference problems with localization throughout and uh, feel free to think about any of these uh, basically, but uh, I'd be happy with some of the weaker versions. Um, even the statement that type closure does not localize, right? I believe the type closure is still not known whether it localizes well after inverting a single element. It's known that if you vocalize it a prime, it's bad. Right, so, but these are very subtle questions. Okay, great. Any questions so far? Okay. So, um, uh, as we start to sort of build up uh, um, some more things here, right, so, um, uh, let me reintroduce some notation from last week, right? So the sort of Frobenius push forward notation now in the previous lecture series um, or in the previous set of notes, uh, we have both push forward and pull back or a restriction and extension of scalars, if you will. So uh, I've tried to, to minimize the amount of notation to be used. So, but I, I do need to use this um, a restriction of scalars functor, right? So recall that, um, uh, so I have, uh, um, the restriction of scalars of an R module M is uh, for the e iter eth iterative Frobenius, right? We just denote by F to the E lower star M. All right. Um, and uh, I sort of want to sort of tell you how I think about this. So uh, on the one hand, all right, so as an abelian group, you've done nothing. Okay. So uh, here F to the E lower star M sort of as a set is still just in bijective correspondence with the original module. And moreover, how do I add two guys? Well, I add them just how I would have added them before. Okay. What I've really done in doing this restrict restriction of scalars is uh, played around with the R multiplication structure and twisted it by the eth iterative, eth iterative Frobenius, right? So um, how do I multiply R times uh, F to the E lower star of M, right? Um, well, that gives me F to the E lower star of R to the P to the E times M, right? So um, R now acts by P to the E powers instead, okay? Um, uh, and uh, one of the nice uh, things about introducing this notation is um, before when I've talked about Frobenius, I've thought about really F to the E uh, as being a ring endomorphism, right? But it certainly when I write it in this way is not an R module endomorphism or R module map at all, right? This map here is not R linear because the R module structure you should use on the right side is different. Namely, you should use this twisted structure, right? So um, here, um, 
Uh, another perspective on the eth iterative Frobenius is as the map from R to say uh, f to the e lower star R, right? All right, so again, this just sends say little r to f to the e lower star of r to the p to the e, right? So, um, and, and you can sort of see this uh, sort of in the back and forth. All I've really done is I've taken the right hand side of this thing and added the f to the e lower stars kind of as decoration. Right, so it's like a painting, right? Um, uh, but in doing and but in doing so, you see that we fixed this sort of R module problem, right? So here, um, this of course is R f to the e lower star of one, right? So um, this map here is determined by sending one to one, right, and is now R linear. Okay. Um, uh, um, you also saw last week another way to think about this here, R as a domain, right? So you can also think of F to the E lower star R as being uh, the ring R to the one over P to the E, right? The ring of P to the Eth roots of elements of R. Um, uh, I use all of these notations in my daily life, right? So I've tried to minimize it here and to stick to just the F to the E lower star notation, but feel free just again to think of the F to the E lower star as P to the eth roots everywhere, and you really won't go uh, too far uh, afield. All right, great. Okay, so um, we had at the beginning here uh, some uh, set of assumptions that R was an Ethereum uh, domain of characteristic P, and I want to add uh, one other one that I'm going to use throughout all the lectures, all right, sort of for simplicity. Right, so I'm going to assume that R is so called F finite. Now, what is this? Right, so this is just the assumption. That f the e lower or f lower star of r, right, is a finitely generated r module. Okay, um, uh, so uh, um, let's see. Make sure that doesn't pull up. Pull up. All right, so um, uh, so. This assumption is pretty mild, right? Um, it's satisfied by rings in most most uh, geometric and arithmetic settings. Um, um, we'll see that in more in a second, all right? So, um, but uh, um, uh, while mild, it does have a bunch of important uh, sort of implications um, that really make uh, make sure that you're working with pretty nice rings. Just as one example, uh, Gabber has shown that an F finite ring is always a quotient of an excellent regular ring. Right. So in particular, um, a theorem of Kuhn's uh, follows as a result that R is is automatically excellent. Um, moreover, since it's the quotient of a regular, hence Borenstein ring, um, it has a dualizing complex uh, and uh, um, uh, works well with duality. So you get a lot of really nice things out of this. All right. OK, so um, let me also say that, um, of course, uh, if f lower star r is a, a finitely generated r module, then you can repeat this process with the iterates as well. And so it's equivalent to ask that f to the e lower star r is a finitely generated r module for all e, um, all the iterates of Frobenius, if you like. OK. All right, so let me tell you maybe one more case in which it's easy to show that something is f-finite. Um, we'll see uh, throughout the lecture series that you, it, it's easy to see that um, either a power series or a polynomial ring over, uh, uh, say, a perfect field uh, is automatically f-finite, and we'll do that explicitly a bit later on. But then this you can use to give a whole bunch of other examples in particular. All right, so using that sort of the push-forward notation is compatible with localization. Right. Um, it follows that if you take an f finite ring, then any localization of an f finite ring is also still f finite. Um, and uh, similarly, well, if R is local, right? Say with maximal ideal M, and I look at the M at a completion. Right. Um, oh, I guess I should do this really in two steps. So I can think about the completion of that thing as an R module. 
All right. Um, and that's the same as just tensoring with uh, R hat uh, because I've assumed F to the E lower star is finitely generated here. Right. Uh, obviously, but you can also check that you don't need the F finite assumption for that first equality. Right. Um, Right, so, but again, uh, this push forward notation is compatible with completion. So again, you're allowed to take any finite, F finite local ring and complete it, and you still stay F finite as well, okay? Um, so uh, very easy to come up with lots of examples, and most of the things we'll run into throughout, certainly the lecture series, and that I run into naturally in life satisfy this assumption. All right, so, but. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Just have a question real quick. Um, doesn't it suffice to check for a single E that F lower star, F e lower star R is? That's right. So um, I could also take this for all and write uh, for some, all right? Um, and that also works totally fine. Okay. All right. So um, okay. So uh, uh, some of the implications of f fine and as I mentioned, at least verbally, are a little more highbrow. Let me go back back down to earth here. Really, I really really need throughout this lecture series one thing that we're going to use over and over again, basically, namely um, that if I take an f finite ring then for all E, the sort of home set uh, from F to the E lower star R back to R is compatible with localization and completion again, right? So here, what do I mean by that? All right, so um, here, uh, Right, so um, what this says is I can move this uh, um, localization inside of the HOM. Okay, and of course I've used again this property that I can move with the W inverse inside of F to the E lower star as well in this process, all right? Um, and same thing uh, in the completion case. All right, um, and again, why does this follow? Well, um, uh, in general, whenever I take a HOM and the first entry here is finally presented, then it's compatible with flat base change. All right, so um, in, in our setting here, um, certainly localization and then uh, um, all my local rings are in Ethereum. So uh, completion of this local ring is also flat, right? So I can just move these things inside very easily, um, but I, I need a finiteness to do that, okay? Any questions? All right, um, and, and where is this HOM set gonna come up? Well, we'll see that sort of immediately. Um, uh, I think about this HOM set here is the set of all potential splittings of the ETH iterative Frobenius, right? So let me uh, recall here um, what a, a F splitting is. All right, so um, an F splitting uh, is simply uh, um, uh, R module retraction uh, for Frobenius here, right? So it's a map in HOM F lower star R back to R, which is R linear and sends one to one. So put it another way. Um, here, if I look at the Frobenius map, R to F lower star R, as we saw, um, then, uh, and F splitting is a map that heads back the other way so that the composition here is the identity map on R, okay? Um, why do you call it F splitting? Well, another uh, consequence of this thing is of course that this then splits as an R module as R direct sum something else. Okay, so it sort of splits this, this R factor off, okay? Um, uh, so, and take this as a definition, if you will, right? And uh, um, sort of uh, to follow up on the previous comment here, right? So uh, you could also hear what this was a splitting of um, the of the first Frobenius map, but I could also look for splittings of the Frobenius iterates, right? And it's easy to see that a composition of split maps is split um, um, and sort of to also go back the other way. So uh, it's equivalent to ask here, 
that R is F to the E split. for all e bigger than zero. And again, um, it suffices actually to check for a single e, right? So, but um, I'm just gonna sort of use uh, maybe the non-standard term f to the e split um, uh, here, perhaps throughout. Okay, um, great. So um, uh, the first sort of uh, result I wanna sort of sketch for you is the following. So here we have a definition of what it means for r to be f split. And um, the result I want to talk about um, is, well, if you're regular, then you're also F split, right? And in some sense, uh, maybe the existence of test elements argument really comes down to saying something a bit stronger. And we'll quantify that in a second. If you're regular, in fact, I want you to think in your mind that you are very F split, right? That there are tons of these things, okay? Um, and in order to see that a regular ring is F split, um, I need to go back to uh, the characterization of regularity in terms of Frobenius that uh, was talked about last week, i.e. our uh, regular our ring is regular in characteristic P if and only if uh, um, Frobenius is flat or all of its iterates are flat, same thing. Um, all right, all right, and what does that mean? Uh, all right, so, well, uh, I've added this uh, special assumption here that R is a finite, right? So flatness is the same as saying that F to the E lower star R is a finitely generated projective uh, R module, right? So um, uh, because, uh, okay. Right, so I get, here's another place where I've used the F finite assumption uh, to do that. And of course, um, uh, here uh, I could have, instead of saying projective, also said locally free, right? And that's really how I'm gonna use, uh, use this characterization, okay? All right, great. So um, let's see uh, here uh, this statement that R is regular implies that it's also F split. Okay, all right, so to do so, um, I want to look here at uh, um, the evaluation at one map, and this is maybe the first time this is coming up, but it's gonna come up over and over again, right? So take this HOM set, which I wanna think of as the set of all potential splittings of the ETH iterative for BNES, okay? Um, uh, and look at the map, which uh, just takes a homomorphism and it takes the evaluation at one. Okay, so that's an R module map here back from the HOM set. Now, um, when I do that, um, asking that R is F split is asking if I can send one to one. So it's simply asking, is this map uh, surjective? Can I hit one? Okay. Um, so uh, asking if this is surjective, of course, can be checked locally. All right, so without loss of generality, let's say that RM is local and I have to just check that regular implies F split, okay? And again, uh, again, uh, for those keeping track at home, again, I've used that that HOM set there is compatible with localization to any maximal ideal, for example. Okay. Um, now, in general, um, now that I'm in the local setting, uh, F to the E lower star R is a free R module, right? Um, so uh, um, I want to think about the following sort of as an abstract question here. Um, if I take any free R module, right, I want to know when can I take an, uh, given an element of that R module, when can I find a homomorphism that sends it to one, that splits it off? Okay, um, and uh, it's pretty easy to see uh, just thinking about the projection maps onto the different factors of this free R module that you can send something to one if and only if one of the components of this free R module is a unit, right? Um, so the projections onto the different factors um, generate the HOM set. 
Um, and uh, if all of those are inside the maximal ideal, then there's no hope. But if one of them is not, then you can just multiply by the inverse and send it to one. So easy to convince yourself the things in a free R module that can be sent to one under some homomorphism back to R are exactly, oops, uh, the uh, things that are in M times G. Okay, what's the conclusion? Well, um, if I take an element, little r and r, um, then when can I find a potential f splitting that sends it to one? Well, this happens if and only if um, f to the e lower star r is not in m f to the e lower star r, right? Um, which is the same thing as saying, OK, so of course, this is f to the e lower star of m bracket p to the e. Right, so that's the same as asking that R uh, is not in the eth Verbenius power um, of, of the maximal ideal. All right, so to conclude that my regular local rings F split or F to the E split, it simply suffices to observe that one is of course not in um, this, uh, this guy. So it's F to the e split. Okay, and there's our first sort of proof. All right, so um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, but again, sort of the mantra of these sort of this first lecture is I want you to think of a regular ring here as being very F split. And we've seen here that it's, it's much easier to send not just one, but lots of things. I can split off and send those to one. So that brings us to uh, sort of our next definition. Right, so um, R is strongly F regular um, uh, if the following condition holds. Well, I want to be able to take any non zero element of the ring, um, and I want that there exists some E bigger than zero and some potential F splitting. Um, with a property that I can send f to the e lower star d to one, all right? So, so in other words, um, R is said to be strongly F regular if given any non-zero element to the ring, after taking enough uh, Frobenius push forwards, I can send that element back to one, okay? And so essentially it follows from the arguments uh, we used here uh, to show that R is regular and implies F split, um, we can see a, a much stronger statement. It's easy to get lots of things and send them to one. So that brings us to the sort of the next lemma here. Um, R is regular uh, implies that it's also in fact strongly F regular. And uh, where does this word really come from here, right? We saw weakly F regular before, um, strongly F regular, um, uh, is meant to be a, a stronger condition, all right? So uh, then this weak F regularity, all right? And it arose really from an attempt to uh, show that uh, F regularity localized, right? So in fact, strong F regularity implies that all localizations of R are weakly F regular, um, i.e. This, this right condition was what uh, historically was called F regularity directly. All right, are there any questions about the lemma or the statement? All right, so let's go through a proof real quick. Okay, so um, again, all right, so let's check the first one. So I wanna show that if R is regular, then it's also in fact strongly F regular using more or less the arguments we just uh, looked at, right? So in the R regular implies F split, we looked at the evaluation at one map and I wanna do sort of a variant on that same trick. So if you take any non-zero element of the ring, for large E, for instance, I could look at um, uh, the map from F to the E lower star, or the map from the HOM set of potential uh, F to the E splittings back to R, which is really, instead of evaluation at one, it's the evaluation at F to the E lower star D instead, all right? And again, um, saying that uh, R is strongly F regular simply says that this ideal IE is trivial um, for some E, 
Okay. Um, so I'm trying to check that this ideal is trivial. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, great. Um, and uh, in fact, um, it suffices to check it, or, well, once you've shown it for one E, uh, we can check to see that it is true for all larger E as well. All right, uh, yes. So uh, just to answer a question in the chat, all the rings are finite, right? Um, great. So um, uh, using that R is F split, which we know since we just, we, since R was regular, right? Um, in fact, these ideals are ascending, right? So let me pick an F splitting, let's call it chi. Right, and let me argue to you that um, uh, these ideals are getting bigger and bigger, right? Um, so, uh, well, let's say you take some element X in IE, then since IE is an ideal, certainly X to the P is in IE as well, right? Um, uh, so, uh, and, uh, um, how is the ideal IE defined? Well, it's defined as the set of elements so that I can find a map from F to E lower star R back to R, which sends uh, F to the E lower star of D to, to that element, right? And what I can do now is uh, um, push this forward one more time under Frobenius, okay? All right, so um, hit this with F lower star. Whoops. All right, so if the original map was phi, right? Um, uh, I can find, uh, um, I can push that forward and now I get a map from F to the E plus one lower star R back to R, which sends D to X to the P. And now I can hit uh, hit that with my F splitting chi, right? Now, if I think about that, um, I've rigged it, right? So this is X times F lower star one, chi sends one to one. So this sends uh, F lower star of X to the P here, just to X, all right? All right, great. Oh doesn't finish the proof, finishes the first claim here, right? That uh, these ideals are ascending, right? Um, okay, so if we're trying to show that some IE is trivial, right? I know they're ascending, um, checking that one of them is trivial uh, is equivalent to checking that the here, um, uh, here it suffices to check now, since they're getting bigger and bigger, to check that their sum, i.e. The, the union over all the IEs is R. Right, so again, uh, R here is Noetherian, so a sum over these ideals, if they're getting bigger and bigger, is just equal to IE again itself for some large E, okay? Right, so again, we can check this locally. All right, um, and now, we saw before um, that you can split something off and send it to one exactly when it's not in the uh, Frobenius power of the maximal ideal. All right, um, uh, and of course, if, if zero, uh, so D is non-zero inside of this assertion here, right? So um, we get that directly, okay? Any questions about that? Okay, all right, so trying to move as fast as I can here. All right, so um, for two, um, uh, to see uh, that, um, if you're strong there for regular, then every uh, um, all localizations of R are weak there for regular. 
it, it suffices here. Um, uh, since strong F regularity is compatible with localization, sort of from the definition, it suffices simply to prove that strongly F regular implies weakly F regular, i.e. that all ideals are tightly closed, right? So um, uh, let's check that implication. Well, if X is in I star, then, uh, so then by definition, this means there exists some non-zero element in that multiplies, whoops, that multiplies x to the p to the e back into i bracket p to the e for all e, all right? Um, and what I can do is I can find a map um, from f to the e lower star r back to r by assumption, call it phi, which sends f to the e lower star d to one, okay? Um, and when I do that, then it's pretty easy string of checks here. So, okay, so that means x is x times one. This is x times phi of f to the e lower star of d. I can bring that x in. Right? And now I can use the tight closure relation. to say that that's in phi of i bracket p to the e, right? And of course, uh, I can then move that bracket power out so that thing is in i, okay? So easy to check that if you're strongly F regular, then you're also weakly F regular as well, okay? All right, so that finishes the proof of uh, sort of this lemma here on the left. If R is regular, it's also strongly F regular and all the localizations are weakly F regular. Okay. All right, great. So um, I wanna get as quick as we can here to sort of the next uh, um, test ideal. Um, and to do that, um, uh, let me introduce the following notion. Right, so um, we say that a, an ideal I inside of R is uniformly F compatible. If and only if, um, okay, so uh, I, I've written it in some gross formulaic way here, right? But let me say it more in layman's terms, right? For all E and all uh, potential uh, P to the ETH splittings or splittings of the ETH iterative Frobenius, the ideals preserved under those splittings or potential splittings, okay? Or said another way, I could write this as some really kind of nasty sum, right? Look at a sum over all of the E's and all of the maps. And I wanna look at all the evaluations on I and I require that you're still inside of I, okay? Um, great. Um, uh, so uh, let me sort of reformulate this uh, in a slightly different way, okay? Um, and talk for just a second about the, the Cartier algebra of R. All right, so, um, well, um, uh, this came up in our proof uh, already, right? But one of the weird things that I ended up having to do was compose a potential splitting push it forward and then compose with a, another actual F splitting in the proof, right? Um, uh, so uh, the Cartier algebra here is just a, a sort of formalism that makes it a little easier to write that down, right? So, uh, and, and again, um, right? So um, I want you to think about a map inside of HOM F to the E lower star R comma R, right? What does it mean to take such a map well, uh, F to the E lower star R is just R as a set. Um, and uh, so if I forget about the decoration, it's just an additive map here on R, right? And all I'm really doing is I'm rigging it so that P to the ETH powers pull out, right? So I, I've rigged it so that the map is so-called P to the minus E linear. Okay. 
Um, and the advantage here, uh, if I forget about the decorations, which I went into this uh, uh, effort to define earlier, is really that if, uh, as soon as I've uh, rigged it this way, now the source and target here are the same. So uh, if I take a P to the minus one, E1 one linear map and a P to the minus E2 linear map, then it's easy to check that phi one of phi two, which uh, I can just compose them directly. This thing is a E1 plus E2, P to the minus E1 minus E2 linear map. All right, so said in other words, this is some formal way here of doing what came up inside of this previous proof, right? So um, what does this correspond to? Well, um, really uh, this corresponds to, if I write it in a, this sort of other uh, notation with push forwards, I should think about taking the product phi one of five two is really, well, how do I compose the maps? I first have to push forward right, under one of the iterates of Verbenius in order to do that, right? So the Cartier algebra is just a, a, say, a way of sort of forgetting about the Verbenius push forwards to make that easier, right? Um, and so with that though, um, uh, you can form what's called the total Cartier algebra, right? So just take a direct sum over all of these Homs or over all of these uh, P to the minus E linear maps for all E and uh, under function composition, this becomes now um, uh, uh, non-commutative ring, okay? Um, I, I use the word algebra here because it's traditional, all right? So, but let me just say real quick that there is some abuse of language here, right? So um, this ring, the total, total Cartier algebra is um, uh, neither commutative nor is it in our algebra, right? So when you say something is an algebra, uh, usually that means that R has to be in the center of the ring and that's not true. R is the zeroth graded piece of this ring. Um, however, um, if I take an element R and R and some element say phi and CRE, then by uh, construction, we have R phi is phi of R to the P to the E, right? So it picks up this skew linearity, um, what's going on here. Okay, okay. so um, uh, what's the advantage of sort of uh, putting this in? Um, it makes it much easier for me to write down what it means to have a uh, uniformly F compatible ideal, namely uh, um, uh, an R, uh, ideal is uniformly F compatible if, uh, um, well, I can think about R as being a module over this non commutative ring on the left by evaluation. And I is uniformly F compatible just means that if I look at the whole Cartier algebra and evaluate that on I, then that has to be contained inside of I, right? So you can see here, um, I will use this notation later in some of the talks, right? This makes it sort of much easier and quicker for me to write down what it means for one of these ideals to be uniformly F compatible, okay? All right, so here um, to sort of, uh, as we build towards the conclusion of the lecture, I want to sketch for you the proof, right, that test elements exist, right? So this is where we've sort of been building up to the whole time, right? And the first observation is that um, this finitistic test ideal is uniformly F compatible. And again, uh, like uh, earlier, I've sketched this out as an exercise in the notes, all right? So to show that uh, um, test elements exist, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna argue for you um, using some of the machinery we've built up that there is a non-zero element C that's contained in every non-zero uniformly F compatible ideal of the ring. And in particular, it'll be contained inside of tau, tau finitistic R, right? So IE, C is a test element, okay? Um, is everyone happy with the theorem as stated? Okay, let's see if we can get this done. Okay, so, um, uh, all right, here's my proof. 
All right. So the first, um, we're going to use a bunch of the things we've already built up, is you can find a non-zero element so that when you invert it, R is regular, R join one over X is regular. All right. So that, that does require something. R has to be nice. So R is excellent here. So there's no problem with that. All right. Um, and in particular, we saw that uh, regular rings are F split. All right. And we also know that the HOM set of all the potential splittings is compatible with localization. So um, what that means is I can find a potential F splitting. Um, okay, so it doesn't send one to one. I don't know that R itself is F split, but it certainly has to send one to some power of X. Okay. Um, let's call that element Y. All right, I'm going to try to keep track of the powers and what goes on here. Okay, and um, uh, great. So uh, once I have that, what I can do is I can take this sort of relation phi of one is y, and I'm going to multiply the whole thing by y. All right. So this implies now that well y squared, right, is equal to phi of f lower star of y to the p, right? And in particular, that is in phi of f lower star of y squared r, right? Since p is a prime, it's at least two, OK? Um, and as soon as I've done that, I, I've rigged it so that I've got y squared on both sides here. I can iterate that. So in fact, y squared is then in phi to the e of y squared for all e, where, uh, of course, phi to the e is this twisted iterate of the Frobenius splitting map, right? Like in the Cartier algebra. OK? Um, right? Um, and now I can multiply by y one more time. Oops. All right. Um, and my claim is that that y cubed is going to work. Right, so that that is the C that I'm going to take and show you that it's an every F compatible ideal. All right, uh, to see that, let's take any uniformly F compatible ideal, right? Pick a non zero element D in it, right? And uh, um, let's use the arguments we had before. Well, again, we chose X so that R join one over X was regular. And we knew that it was not only F regular, or not only F split, but that regular, in fact, implied uh, strongly F regular, right? And if you're strongly F regular, you can send anything to one. So again, uh, by the sort of same argument we had above, I know that there exists some E prime. Um, oops. Oops. And some uh, psi, let's say in hom f to the e prime lower star r back to r, right? So that, well, I can't send, I don't know that r is strongly f regular. I only know that after localizing it at y, let's say, so I can send uh, f to the e lower star of d to y to the m for some large m, all right? So um, uh, in particular, since J is uniformly F compatible, uh, D is in J, so I can hit it with any map. I end up still inside of J, so I get that Y to the M is in J for some large M. On the other hand, All right. Um, if E is really large, uh, that I still have P to the E plus two is bigger than equal to M. 
So this means that y cubed, which is phi e of f to the e lower star y to the p to the e plus 2, right? This here then is contained inside of j. which is contained in J again, right? Using that it's F compatible, right? So there is the proof, right? That um, the test elements exist in a sort of rough form, right? Really building up from, from first principles, All right? So um, uh, I'm gonna finish here with one last definition and I'm not gonna get through everything I had planned here, right? Um, so um, I will finish with the definition here and I'm gonna recall it here at the start of the next lecture as well. Okay, so with that, let me just say that a corollary of this definition is, or corollary of the existence of test elements is that there is in fact a unique smallest non-zero uniformly F-compatible ideal, right? Um, uh, I'm gonna call that the non-finitistic test ideal, right? Um, and that is sort of the second test ideal that's gonna show up here in this sort of lecture series, all right? So what is that? Right, so uh, tau non-finitistic R is, well, look at the sum over all E, sum over all the maps, right? And take the image, right? Um, of whatever this element C was, this test element from the previous theorem, right? So when I've done this, right? So I knew that C was in every uniformly compatible ideal. So this sum is then automatically in every uniformly F compatible ideal, but using that I can compose maps with one another, the right-hand side itself is a uniformly F compatible ideal, right? All right, so let me write this maybe in an even shorter shorter, more shorthand, so right? So this is also, of course, equal to take the whole Cartier algebra of R and just hit it with C, all right? And so the corollary of the existence of test elements proof, right, is there is this ideal, the non-finitistic test ideal, which is the smallest uniformly F-compatible one that's non-zero. Um, it's contained inside the finitistic one, right? And it's going to fix some of the problems we had with the finitistic test ideal, right? So you can see almost uh, from the description here that it's compatible with localization and completion, right? Um, and uh, I'll start with it next time and tell you a bit more about it, okay? Any questions? So it seems like C is air dependent C is, uh, so what does C depend on, All right? So let I me mean, reinterpret the question that way, All right? So um, uh, maybe from the definition here, right? So in terms of this definition, I want you to take out of this that the non-finitistic test ideal is just the smallest non-zero ideal that's uniformly F compatible, right? Inside of the ring. Um, it's not clear a priori that such a thing exists and its existence follows from the existence of test element proof, right? So um, uh, in that I've explicitly exhibited uh, this unique smallest guy, right? Um, so from the test elements exist proof, what you basically see is if you take any uh, element uh, in the ring, uh, let's call it little x, right? And you know, that uh, when you localize at it, what you get is regular. Um, and uh, then, then some power of that will be a test element, all right? In particular, find a big enough power so that it's in the image of some potential Frobenius splitting. And then uh, three times that power will be a test element for the ring. So it's, it's even somewhat explicit, okay? Um, but uh, um, in particular, that says if I localize it any element uh, and I get something regular, then a high power of that element is inside of um, inside of the test ideal, right? Um, but this really only the x or the c here only depends on the ring. Okay, does that answer the question?
Okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, real quick before we um, before we split up, maybe we should take a moment to uh, to thank uh, Kevin for his excellent. All right, thank you.